Well, hi, my name is Brad Beasley. I'm a CPA and the leading partner of Beasley Mitchell and Company. We're a CPA firm uh, headquartered in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but also have an office in El Paso, Texas as well. Uh, our firm is currently the largest uh, New Mexico based CPA firm. Uh, we have 75 employees started back in 1987 and so uh, our firm has started from just you know uh, my father Don Beasley and Paul Mitchell uh, all the way up to the, where we're at right now with 75 employees and we service clients all over the globe uh, certainly in every state uh, in the United States but then handle stuff in Mexico and Panama and Australia, New Zealand, all over the place. So like I said, in Taiwan. And so we have handled clients from all over the place. So it's always a, an interesting challenge for us. So originally I'm from Las Cruces. So I was born and raised in Las Cruces. Uh, grew up here and like I said, spent a lot of time in Las Cruces and El Paso. I uh, left for 10 years uh, when I graduated high school uh, from Mayfield High School in Las Cruces. Uh, went and played baseball at University of Nevada, Las Vegas for five years. Uh, when I got done there, I worked in the casino industry for another five years and then decided that uh, there's no place like home and looked at the different opportunities uh, of, of where I was going to be and just decided that Las Cruces and the uh, uh, borderland region was just, just too nice to pass up. And so went ahead and moved back here. So I love the high school experience here uh, uh, in the area. I think the diversity of people and diversity of thought and diversity of culture was, was what really uh, drove uh, my personality, certainly growing up. I did notice that as I've traveled and as I've gone to different places, uh, worked and lived in, in different areas, that uh, a lot of other parts of the country don't get the diversity that we do. And so especially like in high school, we had... Uh, myself and my father was a professional and then we uh, I was friends with people whose uh, parents owned the farms and I had people whose friends well, was friends with people whose parents worked at the farms or worked in food service or different areas and so we all kind of came together and you had all these different diversity of thoughts and and and, and actions and it was just it was just uh, such a such a unique area and and so fun uh, in the way that uh, that we all kind of blend it in together and just kind of create this nice homogenous mix of, of people versus, you know, when I've seen people at, at certain other places, I mean, it's just, you, you hang out with just the same type of people. And, and that doesn't create the diversity of thought and understanding of what other people are, where they're coming from or what their backgrounds are. So academically, one of the interesting ones was for me was that we had an AP history class at Mayfield. It was called History Seminar. And so you had to take one year of U.S. history. And then in order to get into the seminar class, you had to write an essay to be part of that class. Well, what that class taught you was the theory. And we kind of call it the why of, of what happened in history. It wasn't so much the who, what, when and where. It was the why did this happen? Well, why was the Declaration of Independence written this way? And we looked at Common Sense by Tom and Payne, Thomas Paine. And, and we, we why was the... Uh, uh, Emancipation Proclamation written in this way. Why? Not just what was it about, but why? What was the why behind it? And, and what was everybody's motivational factors at that time? And so I think what happens is that is that, that allowed, certainly allowed me through that to really create some critical thinking opportunities and just basically be able to think through both sides of it. It kind of was a debate class because you ended up having to take sides that you didn't maybe necessarily agree with, but also you tried to understand where other people were coming from. And so like, for example, when we were talking about civil war, it was the, or, you know, it was the different parts of states' rights versus federal rights. And you had to be arguing on the different sides. So even though you may not agree with the side, you were trying to just understand that you need to learn critical thinking so that you can uh, argue and understand. So that to me has helped my business professional career in understanding uh, both sides of an argument and trying to understand, for example, if I'm testifying in front of the IRS, what the IRS might be thinking from their side, why they'll think they're right versus why I think I'm right of how we treated something. So it's kind of this, uh, this process that you go through. The other one that I really enjoyed was, was uh, uh, my drafting class that was actually coupled with a geometry class, which is kind of weird because I'm an accountant. And so it's like, well, why would you go to drafting? Well, originally I wanted to be an architect and had gotten accepted to go to Texas Tech as, as an architect. And I, I, the drafting class was so mechanical. I love the angles and, and just the, the process that you had to go through to get a drawing done and the process you had to go through to, to get a building built. 
uh, it just was so linear to me. And I just love that, that thought process. And it's just, you know, created a, a really fun environment. And what's funny is that, uh, you know, all these years later, one of my favorite stories is I had a client that called me up one day and he says, Brad, I, I, I need to figure out the area under uh, uh, the area under a pyramid. And I'm like, well, okay, well, it's one quarter base times heist cubed and you've got to do this deal, right? And so I was like, why? And he goes, well, I'm building a lean to for my hay and I need to get X amount of hay. And so I'm trying to figure out exactly how much I was going to do. And so I worked through it with him and we came up with the number. And I was like, well, there's plenty of like engineers, you know, and smart people that can figure that out. Why, why, why'd you call me? And he goes, well, because I knew you would know the answer, you know? And so just, and, and that's part of it is that, is that our profession, and we'll talk about it obviously a little bit, is that uh, our profession is a very black and white regulation-driven profession, and where you do well is understanding the black and white and functioning in the gray. And so that kind of helps, you know, that that analysis and stuff. So, you know, high school was such a good place. I mean, obviously, I played a lot of sports, played baseball, played football, um, uh, was told I was not a- athletic enough to be in the band which was, which was funny. Uh, and so I was just all state and in football and all state and baseball, but uh, to do that, but it was, it, it, high school was just such a, uh, a diverse time for me. And it was, it was, it was so fun. And like I said, I, I think the experience here uh, and what we learned in high school just really, really carried, carried me through a lot of different ways. I was way ahead of everybody to going into college. I mean, just, just so far ahead. I mean, my, my favorite example in, in college was to get there the very first week and they're trying to place everybody in their math classes and this is huge orientation class with 2000 freshmen at UNLV and the guy gets up and he says okay if you scored a a below a 550 on your SAT then you have to go into math A if you scored above a 550 you have to go into you can start in whatever math class you want to start with and this girl in the back who I ended up becoming friends with after a while she raised her hand and she goes I got a 540 can I go ahead and get in the one class and he goes you know, sweetie, that's where you need to learn that 540 is less than 550. Uh, and so, no, you can't get into that class. And so, like, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I laugh because that's just a common sense deal. And we learned that in high school, you know. So, um, a typical day for me uh, involves basically starting out. I have a big uh, to do list of, of tax returns and projects that we manage. That's the easy part. Right. And so we have a list of projects that we're trying to get done for people. Uh, We do tax returns. We do financial statements. There's uh, audits that we do. We have a a whole group in our office that does bookkeeping and uh, a whole uh, payroll processing group and all that. And so my day as 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 the leading partner, as a manager of the firm is coming in, making sure everybody's got their assignments. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be working on. And then I kind of call myself a fireman. They kind of come to me with issues and I try to put out fires uh, and, and take care of those. Uh, a lot of our job, my job too, is educating. And so uh, we encourage our staff, we call them be a shark, don't be a seal. And our big difference is, is that with a the shark, they go out and seek out the answers. They might need some direction, but they'll go seek out the answer and find it and come back for, for reassurance as opposed to a seal, which kind of just plops on the rocks and goes er, er, and just asks for the answer, right? And so, you know, we, that's a lot of what we do is, is I sit and educate our staff most of the day, uh, handle client meetings. I'm in client meetings constantly, uh, whether it's in person or on Zoom, uh, talking with business owners. And the beauty of, of our profession as a CPA is that we get this complete diverse group that we meet with. I might have a phone call at 8.30 in the morning with a retired former school teacher that that has questions about their retirement. And then I might get a call from one of the largest businesses in New Mexico from their CFO who has this very complex problem. And then it's a construction company wanting to know how to book a transaction. Then it's an insurance company saying, hey, I was just talking to this construction guy and they're gonna do this. And so it's it's kind of all this planning. Um, we, I did a presentation to a high school group uh, here a few years ago and they asked what kind of clients we, we service. And I said, well, the road that you guys drove in on was built by one of my, one of our clients. The high school itself was built by a client 
who got the plans from a client of ours who's the architect. All the subs on the project were. The the lunch that you went and ate at at the fast food restaurant was one of our clients. And so, you know, we have this big diverse group of of clients that we also service too. And, and that's, that's very enjoyable because you get to see that there's so many different ways to make a living. And it's not just a traditional, well, you have to go be an attorney or you have to be a doctor, you know, to go make money or make a bunch of money. Man, there are so many different ways to make money in this world. And, and that's, and we get to see it. And that's the most gratifying part of my job for sure. So in, in the CPA profession, you have to uh, have uh, 150 credit hours in uh, college in order to just sit for the CPA exam. And so uh, typically you get 124 credits when you pass with your bachelor's. And so you have to uh, set up your college correctly when you're wanting to go into the profession so that you get your, your bachelor's, which is, is mandatory. And then you can either continue on most schools like New Mexico State and UTEP uh, both have what's called a 150 hour master's program where you finish your bachelor's and then after another year you stay, you get your master's uh, in taxation or a master's in auditing, depending on what they do. So it's typically a five years minimum uh, that you're going to have to go to school for to, to be a CPA. Now myself, I went and got my bachelor's in accounting and then I uh, went and got a minor in finance. So I went and spent the next year studying finance and economics because uh, I'm a nerd like that. And uh, and, and, uh, and, and it did like, I, I'm going to take a step back. I also took pool and spa management and intro to casino. So it's not like I was just this complete nerd all the time. I mean, pool and spa management was very fun. And to this day, I still use that uh, skill uh, with my pool currently. Um, but the, the, with the CPA profession, once you get done, then you have to have, there's a two prong requirement is you have to have certain amount of hours that you work in the profession. So you have to work under a CPA uh, and then you have to pass a very difficult exam. Uh, so the certified public accountant exam is always one of the more challenging exams professionally to, to pass. I think the pass rate is about 45 to 50% of the people that take it pass it. Uh, you have to have a 75% to pass it. And so one of the things that uh, is, is funny for me was that when I finally got the notification in the mail that I had passed all, there's four different parts to it of the exam. Uh, when I got the notification that I had passed, I was so excited, so proud of myself. And first thing I did was call my father, who's a CPA as well. And I said, Dad, hey, passed all four parts, man. Like, I'm going to be a CPA. And he goes, congratulations on meeting the minimum requirements of your profession. Uh, and at first, I was really upset with him. And I was like, well, Dad, come on. But then I realized that, you know, in, in order to keep advancing in our profession, you just have to have the, the minimum requirements to be a CPA. And then you have to keep every year, we have to recertify with about 40 hours of continuing education to stay up on current items. You, you've seen in the news where they're talking about taxes and tax changes, and it's constant. It's always happening. All these things change all the time. And you have to be, if you're not good at learning, it's a hard profession to be in, but you have to be constantly learning and constantly reading and just adjusting your skills and your skill set to, to hit that. And so, um, you know, we, uh, the part that's happy for me is that I've been able to, to sign off um, probably 30 or 30 or 35 new CPAs that have worked under us that have, you know, gone to work to other places or still work for us or whatever, but it's just nice to advance the profession as well with, with more, uh, with more people. So uh, it's not easy. Uh, the hardest part, there's actually a fifth exam you have to take in the CPA profession. It's called the ethics exam. And that's actually the hardest one and it's open book and you have to test it, but it's, it's very, very difficult. There's some specific rules um, that they talk about. I'll give you one of the examples is they say uh, you're at a local high school football game and you see two CPAs sit in front of you that are from another CPA firm and they're talking about a job that they're bidding on that you're also bidding on. And they're talking about the price. What do you do? And you kind of have to write an essay about what the standard process is. And the second question is, you're at a football game with one of your CPA friends, noticing that a managing partner of another firm is behind you that you're bidding on. And you uh, and your friend starts talking about uh, different numbers on the bid that you're going to do to try to throw them off. What do you do? Right. So it's it's this kind of, once again, critical thinking back and forth. Right. So, 
Well, I think the excitement is, is that they're, uh, when they made the CPA profession change and where we now we have 150 hours, they, they did that um, about 15 years ago, actually about 20 years ago now. And what it's done is it's shrunk the amount of CPAs in the country. And so it's a, a, a profession that there's not as many people doing it. And so the demand is super, super high. And so we all know from you know, supply and demand that as supply decreases, demand goes up, price goes up, right? So we have to pay more for our staff that we're hiring, but it's also an opportunity for people who want to be really good in our profession to grow and can make some really good money. Our starting salaries for our people are about mid fifties, uh, right out of college with zero experience. You know, so it's pretty good little, pretty good pay to start for sure. Uh, so it's, 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 it's really nice. Uh, but I just see our profession growing. Our firm right now we're exploring offices in Tulsa and Denver and Tucson and a couple different places, just depending on where, uh, uh, where we get good people to, to go. So we're super excited about the, the future of the CPA profession. Well, you know, the one thing I tell them is, that, is it really find something that you enjoy, uh, you know, the whole adage of like, you know, well, you've, you've, you've got to find something you love. Well, I think you've got to go try as many different jobs as you can early to figure out what you really, really like. I mean, my first job was cleaning uh, apartments and dirty apartments and toilets. And I realized that that was not one that I, I was very good at or wanted to do. Um, and, and, and my dream job still to this day is if the New York Yankees called one of me, me be their head baseball coach, I would drop this in one heartbeat and go. Uh, but in reality, that wasn't, wasn't a job career path that I wanted to to take. But I think just find something that you enjoy. Just give all of it. If you're not going to give 100%, then don't do it. Just give 100% all the time. And that's what's 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 really important. Um, and then just learn. Be willing to learn. Be willing to accept that you make mistakes. Own up to the mistakes. And then just get better from them. And never, ever stop learning.